Hey, what else? Hey, Aaron. Good to see you after a while. Good to see you. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Uh, not too bad. Thanks for coming. Oh, thanks for inviting. Thanks for inviting, of course. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to test out your slides? Yeah, I'd like to test it out now. I'll say share screen. Let's see. I think that's the only one I can share. So uh, does that show you? Yes. Look. Okay, yeah, let's let's, yeah, let's go to the next one. Just a sec. Just a sec. Um, OK, it's moving. Can you see the next one? Uh, yep, I see brain sections. Yeah, but all good, all good. OK, then it's all working. Thank you. Great, great. And should I get out of it now, or uh, should I keep it uh, uh, Get out of it for now. OK, sure. Up here, done. Yeah, thanks. Hi, Ibo. Hi, Arno. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Um, awesome. Do you want to test your slide? Yes. So. Maybe I can share my slides now? Yes, please. Are you in Guangzhou? Uh, yes, I'm in Guangzhou. OK, I'm in Shanghai. Oh, you're in Shanghai now. You come back to China recently? Yeah, yeah. Oh. Is it OK? Can you see my screens? Yep, looks great. Looks OK. Yeah, OK, so maybe I can stop the sharing now. Fine. Yeah, looks good. OK. <laughs> I'm just in the quarantine. OK, how long do you need to do the quarantine now? Two weeks or? It's seven days plus three days. At... OK. But I think it might just be 10 days. It's unclear. OK. But ten day, seven days in hotel and uh, three days back to home? Or... Yeah, but like your Xiaochu won't really let you in after seven days anyway. So it's it's okay. a little bit tricky. But we'll, I'll try. I'll try to go back. Okay. How long have you been in the quarantine? Um, I just got there on Saturday. OK, so still four days. Four days. Four more days to go. Yeah. In a pen, just a sec. Do you need to have like uh, test uh, COVID testing every day at your school? Uh, not really. Normally, it's uh, one uh, once per week. Mm -hmm. But if there's a positive positive test in the region, then you need to test every three days or sometimes one day, once per day. But usually, it's once a week. It's it's okay. In Guangzhou, it's relatively okay. Okay. Yeah, my code is red. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> because so, you're in um, or... uh, yeah, probably, yeah. But my um, other code is fine. This one. This one just says Shanghai. Ooh. Okay. Yeah. Hey, it's long. We can't, we can't hear you too well. It's long. How about the neuroscience meeting? Is that canceled? I think it's delayed. Is oh, it delayed. Yeah, but they didn't set a 
a the new schedule for the meeting. Okay. Yeah, we still can't hear you, it's long. How's New York doing, Manu? New York is back to, I would say, uh, the same because we we today got an email saying that you uh, in the labs and therefore the hospital because ours is a hospital adjacent lab. Um, we don't have to wear masks. So uh, okay. until now, we were fully masked in the at workplace. So okay. Pretty much back in that case. Mm, good. Uh, for kids like uh, uh, schools and uh, and daycare etc., they were they were unmasked like about a month ago. Mm -hmm. so call it as back as you know the, the circumstances. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been traveling all around this summer, and um, things like everything's back to normal. Yeah, finally, <laughs> finally feeling the freedom. I guess a bit. Yeah. Okay. Hello. I mean, we went to Germany because the, our youngest kid is uh, she was never seen by the grandparents due to the COVID closures. Oh, wow. So we ended up in Germany eventually, and uh, you know, even with the flight with a small kid, that was the only negative. Otherwise, uh, there was there weren't any restrictions at this time. Yeah, yeah, I was in Europe a couple times this summer. So long, are you? Back online. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is okay, yeah, good? yeah, that works. Good. I'm better. Something working out. I'm in uh, Shuhui District. So. Yeah, it's a very nice hotel. I heard. It has a, yeah. a, 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 a swimming pool view. Yeah. Um, so I'm getting yeah, yeah, it's a little bit nicer than last time. Yeah, I guess somewhere I know is kind of close to our institute, like just a couple yeah. meters away. Yeah. Great. So you are you are uh, free this this weekend, right? I think I well yeah. My plan is to get out on Saturday. And then we'll we'll see what happens, and then yeah. But the policies change all the time, so we'll see. It's true for now. It's, it's, uh, back to home. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be good to see everyone again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah back in summer, Hi. maybe we should come back to Hi, Japan. Hi, Manu, how are you? Hello. Oh, Hello. Hi. there you are. <laughs> yeah, the hell I am. So, how are things? <laughs> Great to see you. Great to see you again, you yeah, uh, yeah, We're not yeah. too far from each other. And right, but uh, you know, we just don't get to see you. Like three years, right? Yeah, I missed you, man. Good yeah. to see you again. Sure, looking forward. I feel like this is like a Sudhoff lab. Uh, Next few weeks will be a lot of Sudhoff lab people. 
Yeah, yeah. Lulu Chan. Mm hmm. A few others. You. Yeah, Jacqueline would be there eventually. Yeah. So let me invite some uh, sort of alumni in China. Yeah, yeah. You guys have a lot of symposium, right? It's great. So, for lots of great people. I know. It's a, yeah, it's a, it's a big lab. If you know, were to get together in the lab, it would be nice to get together too. Because we don't get to see each other as much as you know you, you think we would. Yeah. Spend many years together. <laughs> so you got to start it, Aaron? Yeah, sounds good. Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to um, another week of NeuroZoom, uh, Shanghai quarantine edition for me. Uh, great to see everyone and um, looking forward to the talks. Um, next week, uh, we have two more talks. Um, Wei Xu, actually, uh, another uh, Sudhoff Lab postdoc, who's now an assistant professor at UT Southwestern, um, will we'll be speaking, and uh, Peng Zhou from uh, Peking University. So tune in. Um, let me or Zlong know if you want to present your research. Um, you can go to the uh, YouTube page and subscribe to that if you want to watch the talks, or you can um, check out the schedule on, on the website. OK, so now it's um, a pleasure to introduce our uh, first uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Manu Sharma. He's an assistant professor at Weill Cornell Medical College in New York City. Uh, before coming to Cornell, uh, Manu did his undergraduate and uh, PhD degrees in Canada at the University of Toronto for his uh, thesis. He um, studied uh, mechanisms of uh, how misfolded uh, membrane proteins are, are degraded from the cell surface. He focused on uh, the uh, cystic fibrosis protein as sort of a model uh, protein to learn about that. And then he uh, did his postdoctoral fellowship, and this is where I got to know him um, with uh, Tom Sudhoff at Stanford. And he had uh, really um, in influential papers in the alpha synuclein field, um, characterizing um, many aspects of alpha synuclein normal function, disease function, and then its interaction with a very intriguing protein called uh, cysteine string protein. Um, which him and his colleagues have characterized as a kind of chaperone for um, snare protein complexes and how alpha synuclein impinges on, on that um, in very elegant work published in uh, Nature Cell Biology. He uh, demonstrated an important role uh, both for, uh, for, for uh, CSP-alpha uh, cysteine string protein uh, to have the chaperone activity to um, help as snares are rapidly recycled for multiple cycles of uh, uh, formation and degradation and how snares uh, help keep that folded and how they collaborate with the uh, ubiquitin proteasome system for uh, degradation uh, and quality control. He now has his own laboratory where he continues to study uh, cysteine string protein and in other contexts and combines um, genetics, cell biology, structural biology. So. Um, uh, we're really looking forward to hearing the latest about alpha synuclein, Manu. Hi, so I'll share my screen now. And here we go. All good? OK. Looks good. Thank you. Oh, OK. So uh, thanks, Aaron, for the intro. And um, thanks very much for the invitation. Um, so. Um, uh, it's good to be back with, with friends and I guess in pixel form or Zoom spirit kind of. It's, um, uh, I can't wait for the metaverse, but thanks thanks for uh, uh, inviting so I can see all my friends here, many many of the colleagues also. So uh, uh, I talk about a project in my lab that have been, we've been working on the last five years plus. And um, finally it is recently, very recently published, but I'll present some of that work. And the question we have been pursuing is how does alpha synuclein, particularly its pathogenic species, how do they leave the neurons? So let me see how I can forward those slides. Yeah. So in synucleinopathies, many of us do know, in the, including Parkinson's disease, aggregates of synuclein accumulate in the cytoplasm of the ne neurons in various forms, Lewy bodies, Lewy neurites, and these Lewy pathology in Parkinson's appears in the brainstem first. 
at least in the central nervous system, in the brainstem first, and then spreads to other brain over time. And this transmission or spread of synuclein aggregates from cell to cell is proposed to be the cause of a uh, prion-like cycle of aggregation, release from the cell, and then uptake by the next cell, and then seeding of the new aggregates in the next cell. So our study is about how aggregation, aggregated alpha synuclein leaves a neuron in order to infect uh, so, so-called infect the next cadre of neurons. In the process, we are studying a cellular mechanism which can apply to other types of protein aggregates that also exit neurons. So uh, many paths of exits are proposed in literature, generally calling the process unconventional secretion, but there is unclarity there. So, which, uh, so unconventional secretion is proposed to release membrane enveloped aggregates inside extracellular vessels. And some of them are larger, other ones are tiny ones called exosomes. And then there are the non-enveloped aggregates that are released. Um, shown here are the membrane crossing arrow. So that kind of gives us a clue that there is much more to be understood here. Um, or even direct neuron to neuron transmission via tunneling nanotubes that is being also looked into. It's unclear, for example, are the tunneling nanotubes conveying lysosomes or aggregates without any membrane around them. Uh, the, so the ag aggregate release step is very important to understand though, uh, also, since it is relevant to um, uh, treatment of uh, or biomarker detection. For example, if a therapeutic antibodies or aggregate specific receptors can directly bind extracellular alpha synuclein only if it is unenveloped. So not in many other of the states proposed. So while the mechanism of exit remains clear, one point is apparent from this diagram and what I mentioned that aggregates needs to exit the donor neuron somehow. And that is the question we investigated here. Uh, so model mice we use overexpress transgenic alpha synuclein carrying a Parkinson's mutation, A53T, and they become very sick from six months on um, as is reflected in the survival curve. And in this video, I'll show right now, let's see, please. So turn the volume off for sure. You can see that these are litter mates and the mouse that moves now is a transgenic. So it gets really sick and eventually, um, eventually dies by 12 months of age. All the transgenics are, um, all the transgenics are, are, dead, are dead. Uh, and the timing and onset of this depends in these mice on alpha synuclein dosage. This hom homozygous versions, homozygous transgenic mice, which express double the transgenic synuclein, they become sick much earlier, at nearly like two months of age. And aggregation begins to accumulate, uh, aggregates begin, begin to accumulate in the brain much earlier. So we entered the field of alpha synuclein release due to an observation in another mouse model, and in CSP alpha knockout mice. So for reasons that I would not try to explain here is we had a cross of these transgenic synuclein mice and CSP alpha knockout mice. So these transgenics would make aggregates and the CSP alpha knockout mice. The CSP loss of function causes a lysosomal storage disease with accumulation of lysosomes in the neurons. So shown here in, pa in patient-derived neurons with lipofusin showing up the bright dots. So when we crossed transgenic synuclein mice to CSP knockout mice, lysosomes accumulated in the brains of the mice with CSP knockout background. And this is indicated by increased conception L and, um, and ADP5G, which is an undegraded mitochondrial protein that accumulates in these, uh, in these lysosomal storage regions. So in these CSP knockout mice expressing transgenic alpha synuclein on top of that, there was not just lysosomal accumulation, but also earlier synuclein aggregate accumulation. So CSP knockout had no effect on the monomeric alpha synuclein in the brains, but aggregates became accum uh, began accumulating earlier at like three months old. Just a second, I'll move this. Um, it's seen here as a smear up, up in the higher uh, SKS page, higher parts of the SKS page. So we then tested the pathogenic species, uh, synuclein, uh, just a second, pathogenic species of synuclein. Uh, aggregates with either serine-129 phosphorylation or recognized by alpha synuclein amyloid antibody or filament-specific antibody, all these aggregates accumulated earlier 
and more in parallel to the lysosomal storage in the CSP knockout. So this led, led us to check whether the alpha synuclein aggregates are collecting within the lysosomes, since lysosomes in parallel are accumulating to alpha synuclein aggregates. Um, okay, the graphs that are showing all of these aggregate collections are showing now. So first we needed to isolate aggregates uh, well, first, we needed to isolate lysosomes from the mouse brains. So these are six-month-old, these A53T A53 A53 transgenic, so M53 mice, as they're called, uh, mice, which accumulate aggregates in their brains. So to isolate lysosomes from their brain, um, we, uh, uh, we used, used dens density sent. Uh, gradient centrifugation, and we injected dextrans into the brain to make lysosomes heavy. Then step by step, we separated, uh, separated different organelles. So from the heavy organe organelle palette, which contains lysosomes, mitochondria, and peroxisomes together, on a percol gradient, uh, we separated out the heavy lysosomes. So this step by step by step, and eventually we were able to separate the fractions eight, nine, and 10 shown here in the green box. Um, were where the lysosomal proteins LAMP 2A, LAMP 1, Cathepsin R. And interestingly, so, uh, so we also swollen uh, swall the mitochondria using calcium chloride, so it would not end up contaminating this fraction. So these were the fractions where alpha synuclein aggregates were also found, 8, 9, and 10. And uh, using either alpha synuclein antibody at the top, uh, so SDS page separating out the larger aggregates, or serine 129 phosphorylated aggregate, or filament or amyloid specific antibody in, in these dot plots. So um, these fraction combined, we call it the lysosomal fraction, and that's how the world. To confirm that we had intact organelles, we tested enzymatic activities of, of enzymes which reside in these heavy organelles. So perhaps in D for lysosomes, uh, citrate synthesis from mitochondria, and um, catalase for peroxidase, uh, peroxidomes. And essentially you see that the last three fractions, eight, nine, and three, essentially contain most of, mostly cathepsin D and very little of the other two uh, heavy uh, organelles. And in these three fractions, I would like to reiterate, that's where resided all of the, uh, all of the aggregates, okay, only the aggregates and no monomers. Monomers were not seen in lysosomes, only the aggregates seem to be in there. And uh, uh, if, we, um, if we check levels eight to 10, basically on percol and gradient certification, these three fractions contained, uh, I would say 70% plus um, of all the aggregates in, in, on, the, on the gradient. So basically uh, in the, within the heavy uh, organelles, eight uh, lysosomal fractions contained pretty much all of the aggregates. So we wanted to isolate neuronal lysosomes, not just lysosomes from brain, um, because alpha synuclein is a neuronally expressed protein. And uh, for doing that, um, uh, to answer the question, are alpha synuclein aggregates in neuronal lysosomes specifically, um, we generated DNA constructs to express the lysosomal protein lamp one and carrying a MIC epitope tag on the cytosolic side of, um, uh, of the lysosome. Only in neurons, using the synapsin one promoter. And MIC tag on the cytoplasmic side will allow it to bind anti-MIC antibody. And then we generated transgenic MIC expressing the uh, transgenic mice expressing this construct in the brains. So neuronal lysosomes can now be isolated from brain homogenates of these mice by using anti-MIC antibodies, basically. So we can now immunoisolate lysosomes from the brains. So then, we cross these mice to the transgenic alpha synuclein mice, which accumulate aggregates. And the complex transgenic mice here, which will have a lamp to isolate neuronal lysosomes and alpha synuclein to create the aggregates, um, we aged them six months to get the aggregates to occur. And then we could isolate the uh, lysosomes using anti antibody. And then we aged the compound transgenics to, um, uh, to this state. Uh, to the six months and try, uh, and try to check whether aggregates appear within the neural lysosomes. 
So the comparison was between one month old mice and six month old mice. So one month old mice would, even when transgenic, do not have aggregates in their brains. So when we isolated immunoisolated lysosomes, we found that um, as alpha aggregates isolated in neuronal isosome, lysosomes of six month old mice. There were no alpha synuclein aggregates at one month to isolate anyway. So um, no other organelle markers were detectable in the immunoisolated lysosomes here. Importantly, most aggregates are still not in lysosomes. Neuronal lysosomes have about eight to 20% uh, of the total alpha synuclein aggregates, depending on the form of pathological alpha synuclein we measure, different antibodies used. And that's not small though, for an organelle type to contain from the cytosolic aggregate pool. So the neuronal lysosomes do contain alpha synuclein aggregates. To study the cell biology and fate of the lysosomal aggregates, we did long-term primary culture from double transgenic alpha synuclein mice. So where synuclein aggregates were detectable by about 40 days. So we could do a long-term enough cultures to get um, aggregates within culture. So A biochemically in, um, in the top panels, uh, let me see. Yeah, so basically we start getting aggregates up here in the double transgenic, not in single transgenic, in cultures. And uh, in B by immunofluorescence against filamentous alpha synuclein, um, only at DIV 49, about 49 days old, uh, uh, but not at 21 days. Also, we did um, a proximity ligation assay to test whether these are within the lysosomes with alpha synuclein filament antibody and the cathepsin D antibody. By 49 days, uh, PLA showed alpha synuclein aggregates were inside the lysosomal lumen. So they created a reaction. We also show uh, electron microscopy uh, for ultrastructural localization of the aggregates in, in the recently published study, in addition to this. So basically, um, alpha synuclein aggregates are inside the lysosomal lumen. Um, to make it even further clearer, uh, in, in, in these long-term neural cultures, we expressed apex two enzyme, which carried into the uh, which was carried into the lysosomal lumen as a chimera with lamp one. Apex two was then used to proximity label lysosomal luminal proteins, all kinds of lysosomal proteins, by tagging them with biotin, and biotin-related proteins were then pulled down from the lysates with streptomyelin beads and immunoglobulin. In forty-nine day culture, um, basically this is just showing biotinylation process. And we wanted to check if aggregates are biotinylated in here. Um, in, 40, uh, in 49 day culture, biotinylated alpha synuclein aggregates were pulled down. So uh, here, but not in 14 day culture because there are no aggregates there. And um, uh, so that, is, so it appears that in, uh, in primary neurons, lysosomes contain alpha synuclein aggregates. This is a model we can use also to test what happens to these aggregates once in the lysosomes. Does the bacterialated um, uh, aggregate or do the bacterialated aggregate of alpha synuclein, do they end up leaving the cell eventually? So next we ask, is lysosomal exocytosis able to release synuclein aggregates from neurons? Note that lysosomally released aggregates will likely be non-enveloped, unlike any extracellular vesicle or exosomes or nanotube that contain the aggregates. So important to note that we didn't find the released, at least most of the alpha synuclein aggregates to be membrane enveloped. In the CSF of six months old transgenic alpha synuclein mice, alpha synuclein aggregates were present. And these CSF aggregates were susceptible to proteolysis with proteinase K in this case, in the absence of detergent. Uh, so in contrast to TSG-101, which resides inside the exosomes, is thereby, thereby protected by the membrane, um, which needed Triton X100 to become susceptible to proteolysis. Same is true for aggregates in the medium of double transgenic alpha synuclein neuron cultures. The aggregates were proteolyzed by proteinase K, similar to Cathepsin L, a lysosomal protein and neuroserpent, which has constitutively secreted protein from neurons, but not for TSG-101, which was protected by the lipid envelope of exosomes and needed detergent to be proteolyzed. So the extracellular alpha synuclein aggregate are not membrane enveloped uh, in CSF or in cultured medium. 
So the question became, can we modulate this lysosomal exocytosis next to simplify the whole process um, further? So we first identified the snares, which are required for lysosomal fusion um, uh, or lysosomal exocytosis, same, same thing. So first we identified these snares on lysosomes immunoisolated from lamp one mic mice. So which, uh, which these pairs are sitting on these lysosomes. And then we identified, so uh, BAMP7 was on lysosomal membranes. Then we identified BAMP7's cognate snares by co-immunoprecipitations and SNAP23 co-IP with BAMP7. And BAMP7 co-IP with SNAP23 in the reverse immunoprecipitation also. With, uh, so we then identified an SHRNA to knock down SNAP23 and a dominant negative fragment of VAMP7, which interferes with the snare function. So these two ways were, um, could be used to reduce lysosomal exocytosis. Both these strategies, when lentivirally expressed in the neurons, could reduce exocytosis or release under uh, lysosomal context. So if we inhibit, just a second, let me check what time is it. It's, so when, if we inhibit lysosomal exocytosis, we would release alpha synuclein aggregates into the, uh, would the release of alpha synuclein aggregates into the media be affected? So in double transgenic neurons, we inhibit a snare dependent lysosomal exocytosis, either using, using either of these strategies, MAP7 dominant negative or SNAP23 knockdown strategies. Um, and what we found was levels of all the pathogenic species of alpha synuclein tested were reduced in the medium, aggregated phosphor, phosphorylate, uh, uh, phosphorylated at uh, uh, CD129, filamentous amyloid alpha synuclein. All of them were reduced using these two strategies. And SNAP23 knockdown effect could be reversed by overexpression of SNAP23. So is the lysosomal exocytosis driven release of synuclein aggregate neuron specific? So labeled neuronal lysosome contents, we label the neuronal lysosome con con contents in biotin using synapsin promoter driven apex 2 lamp one and then chased these biotin related proteins to allow their release into the media for about two days. And then we streptavidin precipitated from the medium, whatever has be had been biotinylated. And we find that Biotinylated lysosomal contents such as in L as well as alpha synuclein aggregates were released into the medium. So thus, neuronal lysosomes release their contents, including alpha synuclein aggregates, um, into the medium. The next question was um, Can the release species of alpha synuclein seed the aggregation of recombinant purified synuclein? So we added concentrated media from the neural cultures to the recombinant mixed synuclein and let it shake and uh, tested aggregation um, uh, uh, aggregates at different times. And K114 fluorescence here shows, uh, which detects amyloid type aggregates, showed that after a lag of about two weeks, alpha synuclein aggregation took off. And the, el the transgenic alpha synuclein medium enhanced, the two times transgenic alpha synuclein medium enhanced uh, uh, this, this aggregation. It eliminated the lag phase. So we, that suggested seeding. So VAMP2 dominant negative medium had the smaller seeding effect also um, as suggested by uh, Western broadening. And here basically we show the uh, disappearance of the monomeric purified synuclein as well as aggregation by different antibodies. All of them basically show that we had, um, we had a seeding effect from the medium and this was reduced by VAMP7 dominant negative usage. So, and we essentially uh, copied this whole study into the primary neuron, long-term primary neuron also, where can the release of species of alpha-synuclein seed aggregation of neuronal alpha-synuclein and not just purified alpha-synuclein. So we added concentrated media from neural cultures to double transgenic synuclein neurons. And uh, we collected samples weekly and media were from wild-type neurons. And um, uh, so I'll, Skip to basically the conclusion here that lysosomally released nuclein aggregates have a seeding capability in neurons as well, which is needed for propagation of synuclein pathology. And this is the last slide. So lysosomal exocytosis is snare dependent and possibly calcium dependent. So is it regulated by neuronal activity? 
So in uh, so we chose calcium dependent in the paper. I'll just skip that one. So here in double transgenic solutic cultures, we measured release of released alpha synuclein as well as perceptin L in the medium. And we find that inhibiting neuronal activity reduced synuclein aggregates as well as catheptin L release. Uh, and enhancing neuronal activity by potassium or by cuculein increases this. So neuronal activity levels correlate with lysosomal exocytosis, including that of alpha synuclein aggregates. So conclusion is pathogenic species of synuclein reside in lyso neuronal lysosomes. And then these are released via snare and calcium dependent lysosomal exocytosis. And the least synuclein species can nucleate further synuclein aggregation. And the outstanding questions include how do synuclein aggregates enter lysosomes? Um, is lysosomal release of alpha synuclein aggregates good or bad for the neurons? It may be not bad for the spread of the disease neuron, but for that particular neuron, is it good to get rid of these aggregates? And which other aggregates can take the same exit path from tau to 3B43, et cetera, from the neurons? And uh, I'm thankful to the first two uh, co first author of the study, and the Ying and Nima, who are grad students in my lab, and Nima is now a postdoc, and the Yun Mi, who did a lot of tech, uh, technician work for everybody. Thanks to them and uh, other multiple other students with collaboration uh, of Jacqueline Burris lab. And the funding sources. So, thanks very much. Any questions? Thanks, Manu. Uh, awesome talk. We're up for questions. I, I might start with um, mm -hmm. one. Um, so, have you tried to see what happens to or the fate of synuclein aggregates if you add preformed fibrils to neurons? And are, do those go in, like, sort of in wild type? neurons, do those go in and associate with lysosomes? And are, is lysosome exocytosis required for those to go from neuron to neuron? So the reason we avoided that model was if, I mean, just classical cell biological uh, work has basically shown that if you add even latex beads or something, once they are taken in, they will end up in the lysosomes. And, uh, and somehow these aggregates, if they go into the lysosomes, will possibly so you're talking about the uptake part at, in the beginning. And after that, so we did not study the uptake part on purpose on this, because they will end up in the lysosomes. We wanted to know if the cytosolic aggregates do end up in the lysosomes somehow or not, within that neuron, within that neuron that created. I, I'm talking about the, not the uptake part, but the next part. So if you add the preformed fibrils to a one neuron, it'll go in and then it'll go to the next one. I'm just wondering if in that system, it requires lysosomal exocytosis. Uh, I would imagine if any aggregates are formed within the neuron, they will then start to behave in the same way as an inherently generated, um, inherently generated uh, alpha synuclein aggregates in the cytosol, and they will possibly be eventually end up in the lysosomes of that neuron and be kicked out. The reason I'm thinking about that is. You know, like autophagy taking on things that are not degraded well from, from the cytosol eventually end up ends up in the lysosomes. And it appears lysosomes are throwing out things that they cannot digest uh, here. And that's why I'm guessing that it will end up, we haven't tested that, no. Got it. Uh, Dripping. So uh, Manu, that's a very interesting talk. Uh, I, was, uh, I think it's a beautiful, like a biochemistry that's always done. So I have a question. So things like lysosomal exotosis depend on calcium activity. I think actually that was a question I wanted to ask. Do they also express any cytomethagamines? Uh, so not a, 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 it, this is not known in neurons as, well, as much, but classically there have been studied, Norma Andrews labs and uh, since then, synaptotagmin 7 has been implicated there. But we haven't looked into that yet. But of course we're looking into which synaptotagmins might be involved from a, from a blank slate perspective right now. Uh, you know, C2 domain proteins, let's see what stops this lysosomal, because we have ways to measure it. Um, it so, uh, synaptotagmin 7 in non neuronal cells was very well known from before, but uh, uh, in, neuronal, in neurons, synaptotagmin 7 has been shown to do other things, uh, you know, with, uh, with Anton's work. Uh, we are, and Tom's work, and we are trying to at this point study which synaptotagmin or multiple synaptotagmins if they're involved in this calcium sense thing? No, we don't know yet. Other yeah. than synaptotagmin 7 from immune cells, etc. 
So did Aggie like uh, I I saw Aggie working on Vamp Seven on the on the miniature release, right? So so Vamp and uh, also like uh, you know Cinema Twenty Three have been also involved in Cinema Vasco Sure, but, uh, right. the, the overlaps are interesting to see. I don't know um, what to say about the overlaps. I mean, uh, it seems there there is a huge amount of overlap between uh, all and not just the snares, but the peripheral snare interacting proteins and regulated proteins also. So um, we, we don't, in this study, and right now, I do, we're not studying synaptic, um, uh, synaptic vesicle really that much. Uh, so um, yeah, they might be very well in overlap. So uh, last question. So for, for lysosome, you probably like beyond like a uh, nucleic uh, aggregates, you also have a other, a bunch of junks from like, you know, with the degradation. So do you ob also observe other protein aggregate in, in the, in, when you induce this release? So uh, we're studying tau right now, but there has been evidence, which is kind of, um, as I said, the multiple pathways have been involved. So there has been evidence that tau might be released by lysosomes also. And so we are studying that one, as well as the idea that maybe lysosomes are normally not in aggregate containing uh, cells, but also things like lipofusin, like things to get rid of things that lysosomes can't degrade. Um, so that we're looking into that uh, that part, but yeah, it's a it's it's not a generalized pathway for lysosome exocytosis -like yet, at least it doesn't seem so. For everything that it's if you can you call it junk, yeah, we agree with that. <laughs> so well, it's not yet clearly known. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, there's a question from Julia. Juliet, do you want to ask your question? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Hi, great. Okay, um, that was a really fantastic talk. Thank you. Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm a postdoc in Erica Holtzmeier's lab, and I've been looking at autophagy and neurodegeneration, and so this is like really like right up my alley. I thought that was really interesting. Um, <clears throat> so my question was basically. Um, you found you identified these vamps and snares. Um, is the, is that the only thing that the lysosomes can fuse with, or uh, like, or are there potentially other pathways that are interacting with the alpha synuclein so that you can be released in, in other ways? Um, at this point, I will leave it to. Uh, there are papers out there showing all of those different pathways of uh, of aggregate release, oligomer release. Um, the tiniest of exosomes and synaptic vesicles are so small that I don't think they can have even much of an oligomer con content. Mm -hmm. They can have maybe a monomer squeak in somehow. Even synaptic, I don't even think so. I mean, it's about 30 to 50 uh, nanometers uh, would be diameter of synaptic vesicle with uh, about eight to 10 nanometers of membrane on both sides. And then like oscillations like crazy inside. Um, so uh, I would leave it at to that. I don't think uh, the smallest of the vesicles, but sure, there are extracellular vesicles. There is their death, dead cells. Uh, maybe um, uh, other pathways, of course, of course. Yeah, I was wondering, have you uh, seen the recent paper that came out? Um, I think it was in um, cell reports from Biotti et al., where they 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 think that they can find some alpha synuclein hitchhiking on the outside of extracellular vesicles, so it's too big to sort of fit inside, but might be associated outside. Um, so I finally, I'm seeing, uh, I'm happy to see some other ideas because previously nobody kind of looked into the size issue. It's a major size, size issue, it's a major issue there. If you can't fit it in, how do you, uh, how do you move it around? So at least, yeah, that, that may well be true. I mean, it's a, uh, I don't know. I don't know how alpha synuclein aggregates hitch on the outside or because the reason for the, uh, the reason I can't flip my mind around right now is it may well be true that the cytosolic side of exosomes is on their, in the lumen. And cytosols, cytosol is where uh, alpha synuclein aggregates are. Um, and if they, uh, if they could enter, they would enter into the lumen if they had the space there. On the outside of, of um, because when a multivesicular body is formed with this escort pathway and then released, I don't know at which step would it jump on the outside of a, uh, of it. Uh, then again, biology is always interesting. There yeah. might, might be some pathway that we don't understand. 
I think I think it, the idea is because I, I thinking about other phagosomes too. I spend a lot of time is that the lysosome might acidify the multivesicular body. So maybe I guess there's what, what, like instead of direct lysosomal delivery, extracellularly maybe delivery to the MVB. And then maybe the release mm -hmm. of the DPs. Like, sure, uh, sure. If, if lysosomal enzymes like don't that. eat up, uh, don't yeah. eat up the membrane, you know, lipases don't eat up the exosomal membrane. Sure, it, I mean they can stay exosomal somehow. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm saying that if there is evidence, there is evidence. I'm, I'm not going yeah. to say that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, really, really but, interesting. Thank you. Right. Thanks so much, Manu. Great study. And um, now uh, Eve was up. Um, introduce okay. her, please. Great, great. Uh, thanks, Manu, for great talks. Uh, now um, I'm very happy to introduce the uh, Yibo Chu as a next nice speaker. So Yibo has graduated from Tsinghua University. And then after a uh, bachelor's degree, uh, she went to Belgium to do her uh, PhD with uh, Leuven, uh, University of Leuven. So uh, in, in PhD lab and, uh, and the postdoc lab, and, and also in Leuven, we work with GovNet. Uh, she work, working on the series of very conserved uh, family called the Salsa, Salsa uh, CLSR family, so which has been originally discovered by uh, play important role in brain, brain formation, I believe in early neural development. So, so after the postdoc, uh, Yibo come back to um, uh, China and start her own lab in Guangzhou, in Jinan University. In her own lab, so Yibo has uh, make a series of uh, interesting discovery where she find uh, CSA family two and three has an interesting role besides early development. Uh, for example, in the later on synaptic plasticity, even in the, some aspect of social behavior. So uh, today, Yibo will talk about some uh, broad aspect of cells family. So it was one family is CELSA2 uh, wiring uh, regrowth, also, also in regeneration, wiring regrowth and uh, plasticity. Okay, welcome, Yibo. Take it away. Oh, you're muted. Oh. Okay, okay oh. thank you for the nice introduction. So I will share my screen now. All right. Okay. So. Okay, so thank you for the invitation from Silo and uh, for the next years is focused in the law of the story. Uh, a little, little bit broken the voice. I don't know it's in here from what I have. Yeah, the voice is broken, it's on and off. It seems like maybe she's frozen. Oh, okay, okay. So we'll come back. Huh. That's wrong issue. I'm sorry, it seems that's some okay. problem. So now it's okay? Yeah, now it's okay. Yeah, okay, you can turn back outside. Okay. Yeah. I'm right. sorry. Okay, now. Sure. Yeah. Sure, okay. sure, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, sorry. So, so my my so in our lab, our uh, our interest is about in a signaling pathway called planar cell parity pathway, the PCP. So PCP or T cell parity refers to the tangential organization of cells in the plane of the of the epithelium. So such as typically in a mice, so the the first direction, so in a Y type, you're all pointing to one direction, but in the cells of mutants, you can see that they are forming walls in the skin. So PCP is important for lots of the basic development procedures. And recently we find that the PCP signaling is also very important in neuro neurological diseases, such as uh, cells one are finding neurotube defects and others have been finding Down syndrome or autism or epilepsy. So uh, there are sets of core PCP genes. So there are several in mammals, including the cells of Rizzo, Deshapo, Franco, and Prico. So in a typical PCP event, so in the there are membrane proteins of the frizzle localized to the distal side and fungal in the proximal side, but the cells is localized in both sides of the surface. 
So salsa is a very big protein and uh, it belongs to the adhesion GPCF family and it has several catechins. So it's some kind of a typical catechin too. So there are three members of the salsa family, salsa one, two, and three. All of the three members has different expression patterns. So salsa one is mainly expressed in the neuron precursors and salsa three in the post mitotic neurons. Salsa two has expressed in both of the neurons. So uh, our previous work has found that salsas are very are crucial for early neuron development, such as salsa 2 are important for neuron migration, and uh, such as salsa 2 and salsa 3 are uh, important for the ependema polarity, the cilia formation, and the beating direction of the cilia. So lacking salsa 2 and 3 will lead to very severe hydrocephalus. Uh, so about besides these functions, one of the most uh, functional PCP in early brain development is about the exon tracts development. So we find that uh, previously uh, in our in in our my PhD lab, they have found that SELSA three regulates early for brain wiring. So normally in the for brain, there are three major exon checks, namely the salomocortical exons, corticosalamic exons, and the subcerebral exons, mainly the CST fibers. So if there's SELSA 3 is lacking in the for brain, that all the three major fibers cannot develop normally. And uh, so, but if we uh, knock out the SELSA 3 locally in the fanchal tendon phalen, so uh, the cortex, the cortical uh, salamic exons cannot project. So this is a model we call cortex isolate. So the cortical cortex is isolated from the rest of the brain without connection. And if we only de delete SELSA 3 in the cortex, uh, we can project neurons. The cortical salamic and salamic cortical fibers are different, different normally, but the, uh, the subcerebral exons cannot develop. So this mice is lacking the uh, cerebral spinal checks and also they are lacking the anterior commercial. So to study this, uh, the mechanism of this, this wiring further, we further deleted the, the cells are straight in the thalamus, but we found no phenotype. So when I start my own lab, we first found that the cells are two. Uh, has a redundancy with cells are straight in exon, exon projection. And the SELSA 2 and 3, they work together with another key PCP protein, the FRIGO 3, to regulate for brain wearing. So SELSA 2 and 3 with FRIGO 3, they, uh, they work in the same set of the cells. And also we find if we uh, did joint inactivation in cortex and thalamus with combined cream with next free and FOX B1, we can find in both the double SELSA 2 and 3 knockout or SELSA Frizo 3 knockout, we can find the cortical map formation, such as the barrel field formation, is disrupted. So, uh, how about uh, how the cells 2 and 3 to regulate the uh, development of all the exons? So, we find that in the uh, basal four brain, there are a set of cells, is LED1 positive cells. So, if we delete Celsius in the LED1 CRE, we can find normally in cells two single knockout, the internal capsule defects normally as Y type. So if we delete in cells three in this LED1 CRE positive cells, we can see that here is the neurofilament, neurofilament staining to show the internal capsule. So we can see that the uh, the cytomocortical exons, they cannot find their right way to the cortex. And if we delete furthermore the cells are two or in the three, those three mutant mice, we can see all of the cytomocortical exons, they cannot pass the, the, the cytomic and the telencephalon boundary. And uh, also the cortical fibers, they form random lays, they form the like, tumor-like fiber tangle in the forebrain. So to study this further, we find that uh, this islet one positive cells using the islet one creolosatomato label, we can find these cells, they form actually a scaffold, look like a bridge between the ventral telecephalon and the pre -thalamus. So this bridge is, uh, exists in the Y type, but when we delete cells of result, we can see there's a lacking of this bridge in the forebrain. So this uh, scaffold can in, can guidance the later on the thalamocortical exons 
to grow from the thalamus to the cortex. And if that's lacking the PCP protein, such as cells 23 or free 3 this bridge is lacking. So the thalamocortical axons later on cannot go past this DTG, so cannot reach the cortex. And uh, further, we uh, we further validated this phenotype in early human embryos, and we see similar uh, scaffold bridge in human embryos. And also, we've, we have shown another uh, mechanism that also besides the bridge between the, the boundary, we can also find that the L1 positive cells can lead as the guidepost cells for the exons in, in the forebrain. So that's the part of the early forebrain wiring. So the cells of proteins are very important for the exon projections and other early events in neurodevelopment. So how about the PCP in adult brain? Because usually uh, different developmental genes are then downregulated after the brain is mature. But we find that during the three members of the, the cells of family, we found that cells of two maintains high expression after birth, even in, uh, in P21 and the later stages. So we decided to look at if the cells of two has any function in uh, adult exome, so such as the exome regeneration after injury. So first we have checked use the uh, cells of two like the mice to check the cells of two expression and we find that the cells of two is sure is expressed in all the motor neurons in adults. This is a one month old mice and two also checking two months old mice on the adult mouse spinal cord motor neurons. And also we use the uh, early human spinal cord samples and we find that if we stay in for uh, cells 2 and the, the motor neuron marker LF1, we can find that the cells 2 has expressed in all the, also in all the motor, motor neurons. So we further to study the cells 2's function in motor neurons. First, we did uh, the motor neuron culture in, with, uh, in the, with the cells 2 knockout mice. So we find that uh, in cells to knockout motor neurons, when we stain the immunoblossom staining with TUG1 to label all the neurites, we find that the neurites length has significantly increased in cells to mutants. So we also did this. Uh, we we also did this neuron uh, culture. So we did neuron explant culture from early human embryos. So when we did the neuron explant neuron X prompt cultures we find and we now call lockdown cells to use lentivirus to to deliver the cells to SHNA to knock out the knock down the cells too. So we find that in the uh, in the control we use TUG1 we can see validate the exome growth out of the X prompt. And when we cells two is now caught, we can find that the exome growth significantly increased in the cells to knock out exons and one very interesting phenotype you can see some exons they form circles around the exons and also uh, another phenotype is very uh, striking is all the exons they form big bundles in the cells to knock out exons so we can see that you can see those if you measure the bundle diameters you can find them much more fast Fasciculated exons in the cells to uh, knockout samples. So this means that cells to knockout increase exonal regrowth in the also both we also checking the mice exon in the mice and human exons. So to test if this cells two can affect the uh, motor neural regeneration in the spinal cord injury model, we use a motor neural regeneration model, the uh, the BPI model. So we uh, we we have a portion the C5 to C7 motor and the sensory loop, and then put the C6 uh, loop to back to form a bridge to as a way for the motor axons to regrow. And uh, uh, we use the cells two conditional knockouts here, so we only inactivate of cells two with islet one cre in the motor neurons. So this mice exhibit not obvious phenotypes of any. Uh, observed deficit. But when we did the uh, motor neural injury model and we can compare to little mate controls, we can find that 
first, uh, first of all, for the exon uh, regeneration, if we compare the, the injury site to the intact site, we can find that there's more exon remaining and in the in the cell to knockout, so the exons are regenerates better in the cell to mutants. And also cell to conditional knockout improves the neuromuscular junction formation. So normally in an uh, intact side, we can see that the cell to knockout leads to the uh, a little bit of over growth of the exons in the neuromuscular junction as statistics here, but after uh, motor neuron injury, usually in the white right type, so the neuromuscular junction is lost and not regenerated well in the white right type. So in the cell cell two, we can find it improves the neuromuscular junction formation significantly. And also, so we test, we can test the uh, falling functions by grooming test or climbing test after the injury. So we can see post uh, injury following days, so the cell cell 2 conditional knockout can recover, has a better functional recover uh, compared to their little mates. And also this was shown by the uh, relatively biceps muscles. So you can have the muscles has the uh, wet weight has been increased, not uh, being well maintained. So to, for a short summary here, so we find that in adult, if we in activity in cell cell 2 can promote motor exome vesicuration and regrowth in both mouse and human exons, and better exome regeneration on and the neuromuscular junction formation in cell cell 2 conditional knockout after injury and have benefits functional recovery. So since cell cell 2 is a GPCR, so this might be a future uh, can be targeted to uh, improve the spinal cord injury in the future. So we are still working on it. And so another question is about how about the cells function in the normal normal region, in the normal situation, normal uh, synapse, such as synaptic function in the adult brain. So uh, we also find that cells too is highly expressed in adult hippocampus. We can find use also the legacy mice. We can find the cells too is expressing highly in the hippocampus, especially in the C1 region. So we further analyze this phenotype and we find that the cells too knockout. First, we use a sparse labeling, use a new sparse labeling method. So we use the nesting Korea T2 cross with Losa tomato and uh, inject low dosage of tamoxifen at E12.5 to label the C1 pyramidal neurons. So we find that in the cell cell 2 knockout mice, the ethical dendrites of cell, cell cell C1 neurons, such as the total dendritic lens, all the dendritic branches or analyzed by shell analysis shows that uh, uh, overgrowth of the exons, which is also fit with the dendritic, uh, the exon phenotype we find in the regeneration uh, studies. So it seems like cell cell 2 is like a switch between the, uh, for the neurites to overgrow to the fine uh, development, such as for the fine synaptic formation. So further, we studied uh, this further, and we find that cells 2 modulates the uh, synaptic transmission. Mostly, cells 2 affects the NMDA receptor functions. So, if we uh, did the exophilo electrophysiology recording, we find in cells 2 knockout the NMDA receptor mediated excitatory post synaptic currents are decreased in the cells 2 knockout, but the MPA receptor mediated EPIC are not change in the cell cell 2 knockout analysis was also shown that in the memory expression of the AMDA subunits are decreased in the cell cell 2 uh, knockouts. So we have this uh, validated list further. So cell cell 2 knockout will cause the uh, uh, decreased calcium uh, activity and the AMDA functions finally leads to the uh, the abnormal of the C1 pyramidal neurons, which cause the social memory deficit in the cells of two mutants. So, uh, so this is the function of cells of two in hippocampus. And cells of two is also, we find that cells of two is widely expressed in all the, uh, all the brain, especially in the cortex. So we further, uh, this is the 
latest work, so we further find that to whether CELSA2 could regulate cortical synaptic function. So we find that CELSA2 is truly uh, expressed in motor cortex. So CELSA2 is expressed uh, in about 50% of the uh, excitatory neurons and 20% of the GABA new, uh, inhibitory neurons. So if we use the CELSA2 knockout mice to test their motor learning skills, so we find at the beginning, so the CELSA2 has similar performance with their little mate controls. But at, uh, after three days of training, the little mate controls, they get the uh, in, uh, better performance in the accelerating lower load, but the CELSA2, they have only find a mi minor improvement. So to further study this, since the later five pyramidal neuron spines are uh, the, the formation and the pruning of these spines are important for the uh, motor skill learning. So we did the CELSA2 side one mice. So we used the mice to do two photo in vivo imaging of the uh, spine structure and the plasticity. So after three, we did the first imaging and then did the lower load training for three days. And then we did the second image. And we find that compared to the white type in the CELSA2 mice, it's true that the spine formation rate is decreased in the cells of knockout, but the elimination rate is not changed. So if we use the uh, transmission EM to further study the uh, synapse structure in the cells of knockout, and we find that a significant decrease in the excitatory synapse number and uh, uh, increase in the inhibitory synapse numbers. And also we can find that the uh, length and thickness of the PSD is decreased in the CELSA2 knockouts. So uh, since for the motor skill, the acquisition and the maintenance of the motor skills is uh, related with this uh, layer 5 pyramidal neuron they project to the dorsal striatum fibers. So we labeled the uh, M1 pyramidal uh, M1 neurons and then to uh, use optic fiber implantation to use the to detect the, their terminals uh, activity during the motor learning. And we find that CELSA2 regulates the, this uh, cortical striatal activity during motor learning. So uh, one important question would we answer, want to answer now, since we know that CELSA2 has uh, important functions during development. So what we know is whether the synaptic plasticity defects was due to development region or CELSA2 has regulate in the adults. So to answer this question, uh, we use the uh, cell two flock flux mice with cell one FYP. So we inject at one month after the, the mice. So we inject AV cream into the uh, M1 of the cell cell two mice. So delete only cell cell two in the motor cortex and uh, uh, in adults. So we find that so regional deletion of cell cell two in motor cortex as the adults generates similar uh, phenotypes like the CELSA2 complete knockout. So the motor learning skills has been uh, impaired in the conditional knockout, and also we can find a similar uh, defects in spine formation in this conditional knockout mice. So to uh, further, so well, we always have problems in finding the downstream signals of CELSA2 since it's very huge protein and we lacking of the antibodies and so on. But in this study, we use the uh, RNA sec and we find that in the CELSA2 uh, mutants, we find a phospholipase pathway has been uh, significantly reduced in the CELSA2 knockout. And we find a, a gene called phospholipase A2, uh, 2A, 2G4E, and uh, we can validate its down regulation in both the QP cell or Western. So this protein is mainly expressed in the neurons and has been previous studies has that show that this may be related with the vesicle uh, endocytosis and uh, the vesicle recycling. So we then we checked uh, with the CELSA2 and we find that really in true for the in the CELSA2 mutants, we can find that the uh, less vesicles in the presynaptic regions. So, uh, and we also check if we can rescue with this phenotype. So with the PLA2G4E overexpression in the motor cortex, can rescue the CELSA2 uh, KO deficits in both the uh, spine formation, the spine plasticity, or the uh, Western broad shows the, the MDA 
levels in the synapse and also the motor learning behavior. So this is a summary. The cells are two can deficiency impairs MND functions, and we can find that the structural and the functional maintenance of cortical synapse by cells are two contributes to the complex motor learning still and may uh, affect the phospholipase activity when regulates the cortical functions. So this is our work. So we started from development to adult the uh, brain to find the cells are two's function in wiring. Uh, regrowth and plasticity. So we like, would like to thank you the students in my lab about Chen, Bai Lin Chen and uh, Chen Zhen Li and Xue Jing Li to perform this experiment and to thank my collaborators and uh, thank you all for your visit. Thank you. Great, thanks Yibo, it's a great talk. Cell 2 is so powerful, huh? it's probably everything. So that's uh, open the question. I count one other question. Okay. Sure. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, Yvo, that that was really interesting. Um, so, is there a um, unified sort of a biochemistry model? What 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 exactly is the flamingo homolog doing? Is it keeping the? Is it a repulsive cue to keep the axons apart from each other to prevent? the uh the axons from aggregating and form these fascicles is can that explain both the early phenotype and much of the overgrown phenotypes in the in the later develop in in later stages of the animal development uh yes yeah this is a very important question and we try to answer this also uh as uh it's like uh that's uh, there's a Japanese group that before this, they have said that cells are three and cells are two. One is for uh, repulsion and another is attraction. So that seems that I have different functions. Uh, in cells are two, we, we would like, like, it's like repulsion. So because we, when we like lacking the cells are two, so that's more vasculation. But in the early development, maybe this, this is the, uh, can explain part, but I don't think it can explain all of the phenotypes. It's more like in the early development, I think it's like organizing, organizing such as the guidepost cells and the, uh, the bridge to guide the later on exons. But actually the cells are their own because at first we, we, we think they can mediate the interaction between the exons because we, we find that the cortical salamic and salamic cortical exons, they, uh, they have uh, they are defects when cells are lacking. But when we only delete cells in those exons, they still can, can go through. So there may be some other molecules being involved in this procedure to guide the, the early internal capsule development. So it's complicated. We, we didn't find a general model for all of these explanations yet. So it, it, is it a homotypic interaction between the extracellular domains of this molecule that is important? Do you have uh, point mutations or small deletions that can, pre, you know, dice, that you can use to dissect those functions? Uh, yes. So uh, they, they have been studied. So their homophilic injection is important. So it has been shown that in the uh, in the culture system, in the in the neuron culture, it seems that homophilic injection is important for the dendritic development. But for the exons, we haven't done that yet. So maybe we'll try later to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, no questions. Uh, you will, I got question for the uh, adult function, uh, uh, snapdogenesis function of the uh, Arcesa 2. So it's mm -hmm. very uh, dramatic, uh, significant role in promoting snapdogenesis in, uh, um, upon learning, motor learning, right? So it reminds yeah. me, so have you tried this uh, uh, 293 cells with neural co culture assay to see whether Arcesa 2 is, is potent enough to induce snap, uh, snap the uh, formations by itself? So like uh, a new, new ligand and uh, new action assay. Uh, we we haven't done done that. Okay. So yeah, 
think it's a good idea. Maybe you can try that to, to see. Yeah, honestly, it seems to another potent new ligand or new reaction particularly. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, similar like molecule, right? So so might might be involved in the synaptic yeah, genesis yeah. uh for fundamental role. But it's mm -hmm. interesting. Uh uh okay. So do you mean do you want to ask questions? Just all right. So um that's something I, I so is the sensor to the uh, has some role in the regeneration as well? Uh yes yes main in in regeneration is mainly we find now it's just the two. Okay okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, yeah I'm I'm not sure whether it's motor neuron and uh, the cortical spinal tract has some role in, in related to the synaptic genesis. Is it? Mm, uh so for the development for the CSD development is more cells three so if so. What, what what the the model we use here is only motor neural uh, injury in the model. Okay. So, okay. Mm -hmm. So maybe the CST maybe has the function we have did, haven't tested yet, and also we find also CSR two may also affect the polarity of the astrocytes actually in the after spinal. Oh. So okay. uh, we are still working on that part too. Sure. All right. Um, is there any more questions? Okay. If you have no more questions, let's thank uh, Manu and Ibu of a great talk today. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ibu. Well. Yeah, so, so, everyone has a free in Shanghai edition. Yeah, hopefully, I'll be free.